said, we were waiting for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so it, it is my pleasure. Pleasure to introduce Dr. Um, Kerry Nuva Joseph, who is a postdoctoral research fellow with the Center for Indigenous Environmental Health Research at the University of Arizona. She received her PhD um, from the University of Arizona's Department of Soil, Water, and Environmental Science. She specializes in the chemical and biogeophysical relationships between natural and engineered landscapes impacted by hazardous waste and human disturbance. Her interdisciplinary efforts also include research on climate change impacts, human exposures to anthropogenic contaminants, hydrology and water resource management in indigenous communities. Using a holistic lens, Dr. Joseph's work informs decision-making in science and policy to advance social equity and data sovereignty efforts in marginalized populations. Dr. Joseph is a recipient of numerous honors and awards, including her prestigious department's 2019 Outstanding Dissertation Award and the National Congress of American Indians 40, uh, under 40 in Indian country. Carrie is a citizen of the Hopi Nation, where she was born and raised. She is of the Coyote Clan and child of the Snow Clan from the village of Moen, Moen Kopi. Um, and with that, I'd also um, want to acknowledge that today is in, uh, we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Days. Um, and I want to give a very big thank you to Dr. Joseph for coming to give this talk. Okay, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Scarlett. So, uh, you know, Restoring Connection is the, uh, the title of my presentation today. And, uh, you know, today is Indigenous people, as Dr. Scarlett said, as we look to our path um, to move forward, I want to take some time to, to acknowledge the Northern California natives and the Chukchin and unceded territory of the it's Ohani, Ohani land that the UC Berkeley um, uh, UC Berkeley is situated. Um, today, across the nation, we celebrate the heritage, diversity, and resilience of the people who first called these lands home and um, in North America and beyond. So I encourage you to learn more about some of the local impacts that indigenous people have had to face um, in the areas in where you live, um, as we're all trying to heal, heal from uh, harm caused by uh, colonization and the past, um, you know, and, um, figure out how we can support um, indigenous people in some of the uh, things to be more uh, uh, our situations where we can be more inclusive of indigenous people and situations and um, uh, and when we're talking about space in terms of higher education maybe what are some what are some challenges that students at UC Berkeley are faced with um, in regards to getting a recognition there on your college. So maybe that's where you can start to honor the indigenous people um, today as we recognize indigenous people's day. Um, I wanna just uh, also share with you that I'm giving this presentation from uh, the Hopi reservation in which I reside in which I was born and raised. And um, my, the presentation of my title is Restoring Connection of Evolution of Engineered Covers Abandoned to Abandoned Legacy Waste with Respect to Indigenous People. And so it's very fitting in regards to it. It came on Indigenous Peoples Day because uh, in regards to cleanup for hazardous waste, we really have to understand the history of, of how, how science is, and just how ecology is changing um, these covers for waste, but also how can we understand the history of which um, many indigenous people have been impacted by the uh, exploration of lands for nuclear war purposes. And so I'll kind of share with you a little bit of what that situation is in regards to the history of what we are faced with um, here in um, indigenous North America and the nuclear industry. So uh, over 
you can see here on this map on the western United States, there's about 150,000 abandoned mines in the western United States um, associated with uranium. Uh, about 600,000 native, native people live within a six mile radius of these locations. Um, 15,000, uh, I'm sorry, 160,000 abandoned mines um, that are tied to copper, uranium, other types of metal exploration that occurred in the past. 15,000 of those are associated with uranium and 15, 75% of that is on tribal land. So if you can look at this map here, uh, you have all these locations that have been mapped out in, in black where uh, you have locations that are abandoned mine sites, uh, abandoned mill locations in which um, many of this has been caused by the, the uh, nuclear war uh, purposes for the United States when uh, we were making those uh, nuclear weapons. I'm going to talk about more of my work in regards to Department of Energy legacy sites um, in which I partner with the DOE. Um, of some of those locations, the Department of Energy is responsible for managing the sites that have been maybe former processing mill sites for uranium oxide or areas that are abandoned um, mine locations. And so the Department of Energy is actually charged with looking at these locations to understand um, uh, how can we best remediate and reclaim these regions that have been act, uh, impacted by extractive industries related to um, during the Cold War era. And so as you can see, a lot of the sites are situated here and when you remember the map prior to this here in the Western United States, you have some up here in uh, Pennsylvania, um, uh, uh, Buffalo. So there's locations across the nation in which the, you, can, you can consider them low priority, high priority sites. They categorize them based on whether or not they need to uh, monitor these sites, um, you know, 24 seven or, there may be sites that are lower priority in regards to hazards um, where they only go out for um, biannual inspections. So when you look at these locations that have been left um, with tailings uh, early on in the history of the, um, the nuclear regulatory agencies and remediating these nations uh, where tailings were left behind, they um, actually didn't consider tailings waste as a hazard. And so you didn't have reclamation occurring at anywhere on those, that, those map locations for a long period of time until 1978 came with the Amtrika Act of 1978. And so during that period is when they backtracked um, and went to these locations and realized that they were hazardous sites, uh, that they did cause um, concern. They were a source area of contamination to the environment and human health. And they had to put in some regulatory standards for uh, this waste. Um, so, you know, at, at a lot of these locations, especially some of the sites that I've selected, um, I've learned the history that are very, it's very site specific in regards to the extractive processes that they used first. Um, and then, you know, considering whether it was mechanical extraction or if it was ac acid leaching, those type of processes really impacted how um, contaminated these locations are. And so what the re regulatory measure in place is, because this is low uh, level radioactive waste, um, what the policy says is that uh, you need to remediate these locations with a cover cap um, that can withstand erosion for a thousand year period. Although we know these sites are going to be a constant um, 
constant, uh, it, it, they're basically legacy. So if we can think beyond that thousand year period, that's even better considering that's how long of a, a threat they will be to the local communities. You also have to control radon flux. And so you can, um, understanding from uranium decay product, you know that radon is your, um, it, it, it basically that it comes at the end of the decay chain of uranium. And so radon flux is a constant concern. You have to design these caps in which there's tailings left behind to limit flux to this certain standard. Uh, also water percolation, uh, hydraulic conductivity is a, is a measure of water percolation. And so you want to, our saturated hy hydraulic conductivity, you want to limit that to prevent water percolation beyond the tailings and getting into this plume in which, you know, there's a lot of contamination and possibly uh, 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 mobilizing that further down into groundwater. And so these, these areas are very site specific in regards to some of the um, uh, local conditions of the region. And so a lot of my dissertation work that I focused on was that how hardy were, were these covers designed to withstand environmental factors like wind and water erosion? Uh, what are some flaws that you're seeing in these, uh, on these covers that uh, are, are, they, are, they, are they withstanding erosion? Um, are they preventing flux? Are they, um, are they limiting percolation? And so those are the three things that I want you to keep in mind as we continue with this discussion on whether or not uh, these disposal cell covers are designed and engineered the way that, that, that based on regulatory measures and protecting the environment. So one thing is it has to withstand erosion protection, erosion, it has to limit percolation, and it has to also limit radon flux, those three things. Over time, 30 years after construction at some of these sites where meal tailings dust was left behind, um, basically what they started to see in these covers that the, the Department of Energy managed was um, ecological processes, of course, were kind of overtaking um, what the design standards were meant for. So these earlier conventional covers were made of, of um, let's see, I didn't put that in here. The cross section um, of these disposal cell covers, um, one of the main components of, this, of a disposal cell cover is creating this low permeability the radon barrier which um, if some of you are familiar with in nuclear engineering, you know that radon flux uh, has a three, radon has a 3.8 decay um, or a half-life. So you're trying to limit the, you want slow flux through that, that barrier um, up to that 3.8 days so that uh, when it reaches the surface, um, the flux is, is is basically it's, it's decayed. So, uh, but over time, these earlier covers, uh, what started to happen um, is that soil formation started to occur. And so you started to get root intrusion from plants growing above the cover. Uh, there were actually vegetation growth on the, on the top of the cover that possibly could create a secondary pathway for exposure. Uh, into plants, into the livestock. Um, you have microorganisms, insect and am animal intrusion on top, top of these covers, these wet drying cycles and freeze thaw cycling um, cycles through this cross section of earthen cover was creating volume changes. And then you started to get all these cracks, uh, translocation soil aggregates forming and so that really impacted um, some of these questions on whether or not, how does that influence radon flux? How does that influence water percolation and then erosion protection? And so what I initially did for my dissertation research is 
I looked at seven sites across the Western United States with the great help of my supervisors at the Department of Energy um, and the U of A, uh, Dr. Jody Waugh and Dr. the late Dr. Edward Glenn, who has been working on, they've been working on this for, for many years, along with others, Craig Benson, Dr. Craig Benson. And, um, and so learning from them, um, I was able to see what locations were you, uh, where they were actually starting to see um, some of these impacts on their disposal cell covers. So where was plant root intrusion occurring? Where were plants growing above these covers when they weren't designed for plant growth? Uh, the short-term management strategy at these sites was just spraying basically herbicide on top of them at annually to get rid of the plants because you're, um, you're not sure if it's creating an exposure pathway. And so that was their short-term management strategy. Um, and so what I did is I selected these locations where um, there were plants growing um, and really quickly, um, I looked at some species that were growing, uh, the same species, uh, I selected 10 of the species that were growing on a, on a cell cover. So we'll say a ra rubber rabbit brush was one that we found growing above the cell cover. I found a reference location of the same soil type off the cell cover in a reference location and picked the same species and compared plant concentration levels for various metals, including, um, and I'm just going to focus on uranium, selenium, and um, ra uh, radon, hold on, radium. So, what I wanted to see is whether or not these plants growing above the cell cover were creating exposure pathways. And so what happened was you can see here two different letters, uh, A and B represent significance. Um, and the, here, Albar, these are all various sites that I went to select. You can see that they're significantly different on the cell compared to off the cell in the reference area site. So we'll say for rubber rabbit brush at the Albar site, um, that was significantly higher above the cell cover compared to the same plant species off the cell cover. But the thing is when I compared them to mineral tolerance levels for livestock um, with uh, the uh, using National Resource Council numbers, um, they were still two to three orders of magnitude below those standards. So it wasn't uh, reaching um, maximum tolerance levels for a livestock diet, which was very good. And I'll tell you why this matters at the end of uh, reviewing what I found. For selenium here, we can uh, see that um, there was also significance found here for some sites, uh, but you can see that for selenium, some sites had, uh, like here, it was significantly higher off the cell compared to on the cell. Uh, there wasn't too much significance found for other sites, but um, here, when we uh, look at, hold on one second, I'm just having trouble seeing this. You can see that the significance is higher um, off the cell compared to on the cell. And that is what we attributed to um, just local saliniferous soils. Um, there's in some of these regions, um, there's high saliniferous soils. And so we attributed that um, higher level off the cell to that soil type in the region. For radium-226 in various plants, um, we'll just go over one for Tuba City. Here you can see there is a significantly different uh, value found off the cell compared to on, um, and, but still within the soil standard of 5 to 15 picocuries per gram. Uh, I attributed this elevated level to windblown tailings. Um, I got my uh, reference plant sample 
in a location where windblown tailings could have caused that elevated level, but it's still within the soil standard, um, the low soil standard level. So why does this all matter? Why is it important to understand um, the various natural processes that are occurring above these sites? So going back to uh, plant uptake, we're not sure if, you know, understanding um, how mother nature just evolves with time there are certain questions being posed to the Department of Energy is how do we start to embrace natural processes occurring above these covers that may be beneficial um, rather than plants being an intrusion, which is what they're treating them like by spraying herbicide, how can they be, be beneficial? And I'll tell you how plants can be used for a management strategy. Um, there has been previous research done, if you look at this graph right here, on water percolation for these um, saturated hydraulic conductivity standards were measured. So basically what they did is they took out some soils um, and then they uh, measured uh, monoliths soil monoliths and just measured saturated hydraulic conductivity through the soils of this uh, cell cover cross section. They were all found to be elevated above their design target, which tells you that water is percolating past uh, higher than the standard um, in which they had enforced in their policies. So that was a concern. Okay, and then understanding here, we look at this other study, there's, there's a suite of studies that the Department of, Department of Energy is conducting to understand how do we better design and engineer these cell covers. Here in this study, what they did is actually measured radon flux where um, plants were growing, where they found, um, uh, soil processes occurring uh, where certain areas have been eroded and um, what they're finding is that where there's high saturation in soil it, uh, they're finding lower radon flux because if you can think to soil physics radon flux is actually um, water water um, water saturation is good for radon flux so, because uh, it, it slows radon flux. If, if it was a basic dry soil and filled with air space, it pretty much does, it, it does the opposite and increases radon flux. So they found with these radon measurements um, that the higher the saturation, the, the best, the good it is for the radon flux standard. This last graph really quickly illustrates what they're doing at um, one site in, um, in uh, Monticello, Utah, where they actually, uh, they enhance this cover with vegetation. So these soil, these disposal cell covers are now being designed with a plant um, cover where, oh, well, they're being investigated now where they don't actually, you know, they don't see plants and natural ecology as, as, an, as something that they're wanting to fight off. Here, they, they designed this disposal cell cover with uh, plants growing above it, and it's basically a water a balance cover in which uh, the top soil layer is, is moist. It, it, it holds the water like a sponge so that the plant can transpire the water. And so it's good for radon flux and it's good for water percolation because water doesn't percolate past um, certain areas in the tailings. So um, really quickly, I just wanted to, to share some science in regards to uh, what happening at these disposal uh, cell sites. Um, these studies are ongoing and uh, the results are showing some, some, some promising answers in regards to 
how can the Department of Energy now start to embrace natural ecological processes rather than fighting them off? Um, so in fact, they're at the Department of Energy, they just invested $30 million to rehabilitate a failing cover that was um, designed around earlier conventional designs and they're going towards a more water balance like cover where they're embracing vegetation. And so right now they're restoring this cover in Blue Water, New Mexico. Uh, based on those water balance designs with plant growth above above it. The other thing I wanted to mention and getting into uh, a, more of the local communities that are impacted from these sites, uh, my site selection was based on um, locations near native communities because as you can see many impacts are are, are pretty much uh, unjustly inherited by these communities that live near them. And so um, we have, um, you know, we still practice subsistence like uh, farming, hunting, fishing, living off the land. What are some of those impact, exposure impacts to tribes that don't really understand possibly what occurred in the past, what's occurring there now in terms of the science, and what their perceptions are of, of these extractive industries and the scars that were left over from um, uranium extraction. And so I want to get this into some of the work now where I've been fortunate to work with the Center for Indigenous Environmental Health Research to understand more in depth. Okay, so I understand some of the science that is occurring there, but what are some expo how can I help understand some of the exposure concerns of communities located near these regions? Um, and so I was very fortunate that uh, the center that I work with currently is, is partnering with the Hopi tribe, which is the tribe that I am from, um, in understanding env environmental factors on um, health issues that we're faced with here in Northern Arizona. Um, just to give you just a brief little little history here of Hope, the Hopi Reservation, we're situated over about 1.5 million acre feet uh, of land and um, uh, across 12 villages. Our population is roughly about 18,000 with 7,200 tribal members that live on the reservation. We still have traditional and political structures of governance. Um, and, you know, some of the things that we're known for are running, uh, basket making, um, farming in harsh climate conditions, and being able to produce crop yield um, in the conditions in which we, we farm for, for very long time, very, a very long time. Uh, our kachina dolls and our pot, uh, potters are just expert potters out here. They're, they're just known for their, their talent in art. And so just to give you some background on this, um, the Hopi believe that, um, you know, we've been given this location of occupancy in which we're found today. Um, uh, we were allowed to come live here by the original caretaker. And so you find um, a lot of locations in which we've, we've passed uh, our footprint with um, ruins and um, you'll see ruins, pottery shards in different locations, you'll find petroglyphs, but we've always been uh, people who have learn how to, based on these observations with the land, live with the land and understand how to coexist with the land for thousands of years. So these complex knowledge systems are very much based on these careful observations and interconnectedness that spans multi-dimensions of space and time. And so, you know, in order to partner and work with the Hopi tribe, it's really important, or any tribal population, it's really 
important to understand these histories of indigenous people um, and how they've they've been they their history of where they're situated now these ancestral lands that they hold dear to them um, and so when I worked with the Hopi tribe I really came from a lens of indigenous data sovereignty is how do you partner with tribes where um, basically how do how do you how do you have a mutual respectful partnership with with tribes who've had very bad um, relationships with research in the past and I won't talk too much about that but I use the indigenous data framework a uh, sovereignty framework of um, you know the right of a nation to govern and collect and um, own its own data um, it, because it 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 derives from the tribe's inherent right to govern their people's lands and resources. Um, and so what I did here with the Hopi tribe is I wanted to understand what those oral histories to begin the narrative of how these extraction, the extractive like industries due to the nuclear history here in Hopi have had on the Hopi people. And so I, I did, I conducted focus groups uh, with a specific village, the Monkabi village. Uh, I, I conducted focus groups to understand what their perceptions were to uranium mining industries. Uh, the Monkabi village is situated just three miles southeast of a Tuba City mill site where they extracted about, they, they processed about 600,000 tons of uranium and they had no idea they were not even consulted, even though they were already situated there as a village practicing uh, their, their, their livelihoods. And so, you know, there's a lot of concern by local communities as to what those impacts are to the community and, and no follow-up done by agencies in terms of human exposures. And so, um, I, I felt that it was important to begin, begin that narrative by first collecting these oral histories. Uh, we came out with uh, quite a few community perceptions in relation to uh, these sites, uh, uranium, this uranium mill site. Um, there are a lot of protective factors of uh, what they were doing in regards to what they knew about it very limited knowledge that they knew about what occurred there, but still understanding that they had to protect themselves in some way to limit possible exposure. So um, I came across some members that had behavioral changes. They weren't sure if the water from their spring source was contaminated. Um, um, there was a need to, um, to collaborate with these agencies uh, because our youth were our future. They were concerned about the youth. Um, there were different spectrums of awareness in regards to that mill site. And I'll just read one to you really quickly. So uh, one participant male uh, elder said, there's a girl here that lived across from me. We would all go up there to watch movies, meaning that mill site there was a pond, it's a pond. What do you call those ponds? Anyway, you have a water tank come in and put water on the ground when they're excavating. One time they threw that girl in that pond. Everything has some sort of uranium in that. She lost all her, he, her hair, but she's not here no more. She passed on. Yeah, they threw her in there. And so these are some of the, the early childhood memories that they have of the mill site when it was in operation of when they went up there to watch a movie and ended up throwing one of the, the girls in, in, the, in a pond or a holding pond. Um, so one big protective factor in terms of, of what I found in the Munkapi village is uh, really dem demonstrates the resilience that they have as a community. And that protective factor that I found in, expo in terms of their possible exposures or being worried about possible exposures 
was their Hopi identity, their Hopi livelihoods. If they just practice and continue to do what they, they do as Hopi, those things that we're known for, the ceremonies that you do, the faith that you have in, in your way of life, that you're going to be okay. And so that really demonstrates to you the resilience as, uh, as, as a big factor in um, protection of the community. I'm just gonna briefly state to you what we're doing now in terms of uh, the work that I've done. I've, I've moved from remediation to human exposures. Uh, but I wanna thank uh, Adam Carl, who's a, also a student on this project. Um, where we've gone to several household to, households to collect uh, soil, water, dust, ash, urine, air. We're getting those assessed for various metals. We've recruited, our, our target recruitment number was 90 households across the Hopi Reservation. We were successful at recruiting 67 homes in which we're right now distributing this data back to every single household uh, that, that looks at the metal concentration, their results, um, their particulate matter results um, in household exposures. Uh, that includes both winter and heating season um, where we looked at wood combustion, cold combustion impacts to households. But also what I was interested in is we, we also collected some urine samples in which we assessed um, various metals in these urine samples. And I can tell you from, from an indigenous perspective, you kind of, uh, you know, I, I would say that the indigenous data sovereignty, understand making sure that the community was comfortable and trusted our research group to do that. There were very me various methods we've employed for um, the collection of this data, which includes having Hopi members who collected the data, who actually, well, they were able to dispose of the data. Um, they, they're overseeing the data. And so um, those more technical questions of methods and how we did it was important to how we uh, gain trust within this community. So the next thing that we're on, aside from distributing these individual results to these households, is now collectively trying to understand what are, what are the environmental exposures. Um, and what I'm doing now is um, looking at geographical predictors of um, urinary uranium in Hopi villages. Are there any, is there a way where um, oh, is there a way that we're, we're conducting these field studies to give us insight on whether or not these perceptions were in fact reality for these tribes, for these community members of the Hopi tribe, I'm sorry. And so right now I just wanna go ahead and end it. I know we have a few more minutes left here, but um, you know, as indigenous people, we really have these responsibilities and obligations uh, to our nations to define these structures and how we operate. And I've been very fortunate that I've been able to um, participate in these initiatives where my community, you know, understanding the science behind uh, these exposures to, to start forming our own narratives and deconstructing narratives that have been written or even starting the narratives because they haven't even been started. Um, it's really important that, uh, you know, when we're working and collaborating with agencies like the Department of Energy, that there is these coexistence uh, and of ways of knowing. And that really leads to how we form ethical partnerships that are in, in uh, line with what they, the, what tribes feel is appropriate or not. Um, and so that's how you really form these, 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 these um, youthful collaborative 
relationships where tribes get data that they do need and so that they can make informed decisions for their communities. Um, you know, uh, the other thing is there have been policies made in the past which impacted our communities, but in order to really change these landscapes of decision making at these agency levels or every single level in academia, we really need to start engaging in them. And so I hope I uh, gave you some information of how uh, me as an indigenous scientist uh, is uh, starting to help engage in these conversations that will help to lead to protection of, of native communities that have been impacted by the history of uh, nuclear, the nuclear industry. So with that, uh, I'll just go ahead and take any questions if you may have them. I know I went through, I, I went through a lot and um, this new way of giving presentations over a webinar format is, is something I'm still getting used to, but thank you for your time. Raluca, we can't hear you. Raluca, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for the fascinating talk um, and for adapting your talk to the, to the delivery virtually. Um, I'll take questions from the audience if you'd like to ask your question and raise your hand and I'll call your name. Um, or you can type your question in the chat. And Celine, you have a question and then Kai, you had a question? Professor Vetter? Um, sure, even though I just was clapping actually, but oh, yes, I, I can ask my question, but let's go with someone else first. Okay, Salim and then Professor. Um, well, first of all, I wanted, <clears throat> first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I really, really like the data, um, the, the results that you showed of like uranium, selenium, radium um, in, the, in soil. And I was wondering if you had any idea about, you know, the existence of, you know, time series data sets of like the accumulation of these over time or how one would go about collecting that kind of data and what was your process in even just getting this baseline data? What were actually um, a lot of the data that I've collected in regards to plant uptake to uh, uranium contaminant uh, has the historical data uh, that I've been able to find are, are of plants growing directly above unremediated tailings. So this is actually the first study that, I, that has been conducted of plant uptake above uranium covers, a remediated um, uranium tailings, I'm sorry. And so, um, you know, this was baseline data and one of my recommendations for, um, for, uh, for this research was the ongoing collection of, of this plant uptake data over time. Um, knowing that these covers have only been installed for about 30 years. So there's, it, it, it's still really new in regards to time series data. And this is the only um, data that has been available in terms of the baseline information. Got it, got it. So, so, so no, so there's no, there's no like, his, there's no historical um, data sets from like when experimentation was happening or any of, any of the test sites or such? If we were to look back at some of these, I haven't found any in regards to, um, to, to that, uh, only in regards to the remediated tailings. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, so I, I, I had a question um, about radon. Could you speak to what the narrative is around radon management in homes that is not related to mill tailings? Okay, so, so that's part of the gamma radiation. I, we've measured gamma radiation um, in tailings. And so some of this could be just 
due to the geography, you know, being situated above these older geologic formations in which um, the barrier to a house uh, that has been built on top of these areas where radon is uh, emanating from is not thick enough. Um, but those are individual data sets uh, that I haven't really been able to delve into, but can I get, can I get the other part of your question? I oh, I meant in terms of the narrative within the tribe, is it part of the stories or the way of life, um, regardless of the uranium mining? Regardless of, yeah. uh, there was nothing that came up in regards to, uh, to that radon. We are right up against our time. Um, so, Raluca, uh, maybe I can, I mean, yes, Vince. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Professor Better. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, thanks very much for the, for the, not, for the really interesting uh, presentation and, and to share some of the work you have been doing and some of the challenges you or the tribes are encountering in these really difficult uh, circumstances. Uh, given the legacy of the activities in the United States. Um, I, I only yeah, want a few comments on, on some of the activities. I will certainly hope to follow up with you on some of the activities we have been engaging with, with some communities and engaging with them uh, to empower uh, communities, to providing tools to the communities themselves. Uh, so we have been engaged with Fukushima and Chernobyl in the past, mm -hmm. again, where the work of nuclear legacy exists and trying to help to empower communities there. And I have tried to also reach out to some of the your uh, 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 communities and of course encountering a lot of challenges in, 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 in empowering the communities given their state and their, their, their history. But on the other hand, I think then outstanding opportunities, I think maybe to help them help us uh, to better understand the challenges and maybe even to collaborate in the future. So I just want to, on one hand, to, to comment that and, and, and to really thank you very much for your engagement, your, for your work, but hopefully we'll find ways to communicate in the future as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Hopeful. I welcome that opportunity because anywhere we can get that indig indigenous voice and perspectives, you know, heard is very important in these spaces. So. Okay, very good. I will certainly follow up with you. Mm -hmm. that, that's, um, that's wonderful to hear that this is an outcome of, of talks for converse, new conversations to form. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Joseph, very much for the talk. Thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. See you next week. Thanks, Aluka.